Okay. Okay. Welcome officially, folks. Um, my name is Mike, and uh, I am working with um, TechSoup uh, Net Squared on uh, bringing this presentation to you today. Um, it was actually to be delivered a couple of weeks back, but we ran into some issues, and so we've postponed it to the to this morning. Um, and uh, anyhow, as you can see, I'm actually doing this from Hamilton, Ontario. Um, and this this is recorded. Uh, if I think uh, will you can easily download this. I think after the fact. But our topic today is peer to peer fundraising, and so I am a fundraising consultant by trade. And um, peer to peer fundraising is something I, I really um, stumbled upon. I, I guess I, I shouldn't really use the word stumble upon. More like. It's a concept that I, I've really grown to um, learn a little bit more about within the past seven or eight years. Um, you know, especially as uh, you know, in once the advent of social media really took off um, about ten or twelve years ago, little things like social, like peer to peer and, and crowdfunding as well, seem to to really um, take on greater significance in overall fundraising strategies for nonprofits. And specifically, these are it's they seem to have really um, blown up in terms of special event fundraising, but also individual appeals. And I think this is one of the big things I really want to drive home today is how it fits in your overall fundraising system. And you know, and, and peer to peer fundraising. One thing about peer to peer is it's an exceptionally um, versatile form of of fund development of fundraising and this is especially useful when you're trying to acquire new donors so for things like as we call them acquisition appeals um you know something that we can actually make a part of our annual fundraising activities and the other thing with peer-to-peer -peer is this is a strategy that you can actually just adapt to activities that you're already doing and as we'll see you know, there's there's a lot of different directions you could go here. So I think like without further ado, I'm just going to jump right into things here and um, just talk a little bit about what we actually mean by peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. And basically what's nice about peer-to-peer -peer is when it comes to staff and, and volunteers, it's not nearly as demanding as a lot of other forms of fundraising. So peer-to-peer -peer fundraising is basically when the donors and supporters and and other constituents, you know, of an organization agree to raise money on that organization's behalf. Now, the the types of donors and supporters that do get involved are normally they're they're not necessarily um, chosen at random, but rather these are donors and supporters that normally have demonstrated some strong level of affinity for the organization and the people that it serves, and. And basically, these are donors and supporters that are very enthusiastic about you know, reaching out to their friends and neighbors and their respective spheres of influence, you know, just to invite their support in various ways towards the organization. So there's different forms, as I was kind of, um, you know, teasing earlier. Um, one of the more common things is when is using peer to peer in when it comes to things like sponsorship appeals. And you know anything like along the lines of an athon event, like bullathons, walkathons, marathons, um, spellathons, and the like. You know the kind of event where we have to go out and raise pledges from people within our respective spheres of influence. And it seems like over the years, like uh, you know, we've done this at some you know at some point in life, especially in our younger days, in our childhoods. Um, you know, if you're older, like I am, you know, and you can remember what life was like before we had computers. And when we went out and raised money, we actually wrote on paper, you know, specifically NCR paper, where we would keep a duplicate and we would, you know, submit the other duplicate information and, and, uh, and along with our collection of, of funds to, towards the organizations that we are representing. So when you're taking part in things like special events and we're going out and collecting sponsorships, that's one of the more common forms of peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. But they can also be used in other types of, of revenue generating activities, as we'll see in a minute. Um, but the other thing I really want to point out here, I think we, we sometimes confuse peer-to-peer -peer fundraising with crowdsource funding, also known as crowdfunding. Now, they're extremely similar, but they really apply to, to a, a couple of different situations. Now, crowdfunding is actually a form of peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. 
But when we're talking about crowdfunding, we're usually talking about um, short-term, more emergency-based type appeals. So things like, um, you know, we're raising money for, um, you know, a town that has been affected by a natural disaster, or if uh, somebody has to have, you know, an emergency operation. Um, even in some more extreme cases of raising money, you know, for a justice fund, for instance. So usually it's for something that's very, very sporadic and something very immediate and short term. And normally these are the types of appeals that the individuals taking part in a crowdsource funding don't necessarily have an affinity towards a specific organization or even a specific cause. Rather, it's something that has um, skyrocket in terms of relevance and in terms of their immediate affinity and priority. And, and so it's usually something that's, um, and where people would reach out to people within their own spheres of influence, but we're not talking about, you know, volunteers of an organization going out and trying to invite people into the sphere of that organization. Rather, this is just a very, very standalone sort of activity that only comes along every so often. And usually there's a defined start and and dissolution aspect to a crowdsource funding ap appeal where once the money is raised, basically any names, any contacts that have been collected are basically eliminated. So crowdsource funding usually differs in that sense. Now, there's a couple of, you know, as I kind of already indicated, there's some great points to, uh, you know, to peer peer campaigns. I think um, one of the nice things is just how easy and inexpensive they are to manage. You can basically start one up uh, with with as little money as possible in terms of you know establishing a platform. And in fact, you you don't always necessarily need technology. You can we can start when you know, ad hoc by using simple you know pen and paper and just you know taking down names. You know, it can be something as simple as that. But it's they're, they're rather easy to get off the ground. There's not always a ton of planning involved. Um, doesn't mean there's, that there's no planning. And actually, you know, the more planning we take, I think the more successful and the more effective we will be, especially in the long term. But generally speaking, a peer-to-peer -peer campaign, especially if you're doing them for the first time, can be fairly straightforward and put together. And of course, the big thing about peer-to-peer -peer campaigns, and this is often overlooked, amazingly it's overlooked, and it's a great opportunity to actually attract new donors and supporters, you know, and to actually populate your base of support. So that's the one thing that often gets overlooked, especially when peer-to-peer -peer is being used as a part of an event of some kind. So when you're collecting names, I mean, those are names of people, even if they're giving for the first time, if they learn a little bit more about the cause that they're contributing towards, these are people that potentially might want to stay outside for, for a while. So we don't want to overlook the sustainability factor and, and specifically the opportunities to feed that sustainability that come with each peer-to-peer -peer campaign. And like I said also earlier, this is something that you can actually adapt to campaigns and appeals and other types of fundraising activities, not just fundraising, but even outreach. You know, when you're trying to raise awareness, you can even, you know, you can factor in a peer-to-peer -peer strategy with things that aren't even really fundraising related right now. So anything that has to do with reaching out in the general public, anything that has to do about advancing the brand and the profile of the organization, this is something that you can also, again, segue a peer-to-peer -peer appeal or a peer-to-peer -peer strategy and, and even make it a part of that ongoing activity on an annual basis. And with that, of course, it's a great way to just to build your brand awareness, let people know about your cause, and more importantly, um, the impact that your cause is having in the community at large and how it's making such a difference and how investing in the cause is enhancing the overall vitality of our communities much more effectively. Now, it's not just about money because it, it, this can also be about you know, recruiting volunteers as well as in-kind support. So when we talk about fundraising, it's more like resource raising. So a peer-to-peer -peer appeal can be not just about raising money, but it can be really about the three T's of raising time, talent, and treasure. So when we've got volunteers and supporters who demonstrate a strong degree of affinity for our cause, and they're willing to go out and to hit up people within their respective spheres of influence to support a cause. We don't want to, we don't want to waste the opportunity to maybe 
identify a, a couple of potential volunteers or even who knows, maybe even some prospective board members within those contacts. In other words, as we give these people an opportunity to see who we are and what we're all about, and more importantly, the big difference that we're making, hopefully this might resonate with them and actually you know, encourage them to maybe become a little bit more involved, not just financially, but, you know, maybe they've got some expertise. Maybe they've got some time that they'd like to share. Maybe they have a connection that they'd like to share with us. Maybe there's a specific skill or product that they'd be willing to donate in kind that will enhance the overall outcome and impact of our services and programs. Now, it's not all sunshine and rainbows here because there are some drawbacks. And I think one of the things that we never want to overlook is the necessity to actually train the participants, the donors and the supporters who agree to be a part of that peer-to-peer -peer campaign, you know, or that peer-to-peer -peer appeal. We don't want to make, we want to ensure that they're thoroughly trained and supported and they know precisely what it is they're doing and how to do it. Because when, when we just send people out there blindly, there's a lot of, there, there's a plethora of different things that can happen that can go wrong. They can, um, you know, you know, they can deliver the wrong message. They can um, direct people towards the wrong bank account. They can direct people, um, you know, they, they can maybe misrepresent the organization. So there's, we just want to make, you know, they, they might become frustrated if they don't really feel like they're being supported. So we want to make sure that, you know, before we actually cast them out there and allow them to go pound the pavement, we want to make sure that they're, that they have the message down pat. We want to make sure that they're comfortable in using the technology. We want to make sure that they're comfortable in directing people towards their page and they're familiar with the process and, and they know that we're here to help them. So training and support is crucial. Otherwise there's, like I say, there's, uh, a train wreck might be awaiting us. Now, also be prepared for some participants that might be a little bit lax in collecting all the funds um, that they have collected and are in receivables. Be prepared that they might not submit them in time. So we, we want to try to provide our, our participants with some kind of a drop dead date or a deadline where we would prefer to have all you know, all the proceeds in so we can tabulate and make our, you know, auditors happy, etc. So there, there sometimes can be, you know, and even worse when, when our participants have to chase down people that they have approached and people who have pledged to them, even though, like we say, things are in receivables, um, there might be some occasions where not all the funds get submitted or, or, um, collected, so there's there might be the odd shortfall and discrepancy between what's you know what's in receivables and actual cash on hand. Now, when things go wrong, whether it's because they're not thoroughly trained or or an act of God happens or something, there may be some damage control. Um, there might have to be some spin doctoring, especially if uh, there has been a questionable interaction or. Um, maybe something inappropriate happened that might require a little, you know, a little bit of uh, reprimanding and uh, like I say, a little bit of uh, soul searching to make sure that these things don't happen again. So when you've got people who are representing the organization and they're kind of acting in a, almost in a free agency sort of environment, we want to make sure that um, we're choosing the right people who, can you know who know how to behave diplomatically discreetly keep things professional but um, also ensure that the mission and vision remain intact make sure that they're not doing anything above all that is going to negatively impact the people that we're serving now with in this day and age of course peer-to-peer -peer being a very technologically oriented form of fundraising be prepared for some technological challenges or issues you know they're the platform we're using might get shut down as I encountered yesterday with, with something that I subscribe to. And um, so there's, there, there's always uh, there, there's, you know, when we depend on technology uh, in many cases, we're depending on something that really lies outside of our control. And there's a lot of things, you know, glitches that can happen that really go over our head that can screw things up. So there's always going to be the odd technological issue. So, 
But again, this is usually something that lies outside of our control. But at the same time, we want to anticipate that these things could happen. And just being aware that that can be a bit of a hiccup that can kind of impede the entire progress of what it is we're, we're chasing. Now, I want to get, talk a little bit more now about how these things work. So we hear about peer-to-peer -peer and we know it's all about, you know, sending people out to work on our behalf and to raise money. But precisely, like, strategically, like, what does the process look like? Well, I think taking it from the top, I think the more successful peer-to-peer -peer campaigns are the ones where there's a little bit of imagination and a little bit of creativity employed. And so this is where we, we don't want peer-to-peer -peer appeals and peer-to-peer -peer campaigns to be just a, a simple matter of pe people going out there and raising money and asking people because they can get stale in a hurry. Appear to be a big part of our ongoing fundraising activities. There has to be something fun and kind of joyful and, you know, you know, something a little uh, quirky about it. And so, you know, something, so when you're, when you're planning a peer to peer campaign, it always helps if you do employ a little bit of creativity. But the other thing is we also want to make sure we're being extremely flexible in, in the types of activities where we choose to actually employ a peer to peer appeal. So one thing I would always recommend with organizations is do a quick like scan of whatever it is you're doing across the board, whether it's fundraising or not. So even things like, you know, um, you know, if it's appropriate, even things like our AGMs or open house events or any uh, any social media awareness campaigns, might there be a way to, you know, sneak, don't want to use the word sneak in, but maybe there's a way that we can actually maybe, you know, piggyback some kind of a peer-to-peer -peer element to some of these activities. So we don't necessarily have to reinvent the wheel, you know, in these cases, because the versatility of a peer-to-peer -peer fundraising appeal or fundraising campaign is something that can really, um, you know, something we can apply to a range of different types of activities. So it's not just special events, it can be volunteer recruitment activities, awareness building, challenge appeals, you know, those kinds of things. And, and so I was mentioning the creativity aspect before. Um, my wife and I are actually uh, starting a, uh, some kind of an appeal this, this coming um, weekend, as a matter of fact, for an organization that we're both on the board with. And so this is, um, it's, you know, as, as a lot of things are, even as the pandemic seems to be uh, slowing down a little bit now, still a lot of activities are virtual, even though we are starting to meet more in person these days. But we're taking part in a virtual marathon where the idea is we want to, we're going to be um, not running necessarily, but we're going to be covering five kilometers over five different days using five different means of transit. <laughs> so day one, we might walk. Day two, we might walk backwards. Day three, we might crawl. Day three, we might skip. Um, cartwheels are still clutch. But swimming is certainly doable, especially if we're heading up to the cottage this, uh, you know, this coming week, you know, week and a half down the road. So little things like that. So we would stream ourselves, you know, taking part in each of these activities. So the people that we're approaching, that is like the, the people that we're asking to sponsor us as a part of this, this uh, peer to peer appeal, they can watch us in action or they can downstream, you know, download us, you know, once we actually upload things to Instagram or, or to uh, our YouTube channel, for instance. So, so employing different ways of engaging the people that, um, you know, just, you know, just so that, you know, we're not, you know, we, we don't want peer-to-peer -peer activities to get stale. So it helps that from the beginning, if we do employ a little bit of, you know, fun and creativity in that regard. Now, the other thing I think, if you're recruiting participants, whether they're your donors or, or volunteers or whoever it is that's participating in these peer-to-peer -peer appeals, providing some kind of an incentive helps. So things like, um, you know, raising money the quickest or raising money, uh, having your funds turned in, the, you know, the the earliest, or playing suddenly the person that raises the most money, having some kind of like a prize structure. So, if uh, so, the the person that raises the most money is going to get a one hundred dollar Tim Horton certificate, or they're going to get uh, DoorDash coupons or something along the lines, or they might get you know you know Netflix coupons or um, or or Google cards or something along those lines. I, I have to tell you, I'm technologically when it comes to these little things, I'm still learning them myself. So um, forgive me if I'm not overly versed in the array of different types of, 
of, of uh, technological and digital prizes that we can that we can provide some of our participants. But providing incentives, you know, especially you know when when others who might be on the fence in terms of whether or not they want to take part, you know, incentives can be something that kind of, you know, convinces them, you know, in our favor, that kind of nudges them, you know, towards a positive reply. Now, as far as the types of participants here, once again, this is where I think, you know, so before we actually start to send people out, we we want to make sure that we're not overlooking everybody. So it really helps if you sit down and do a a, a long take a long hard look at your um, your current donor files, your volunteers, and and basically any anybody in your various databases or information circles who seems to have been you know maybe they've they've kind of you know, dropped off the radar in within the last couple of years. But historically, these might be people who have taken part in events and have demonstrated a strong sense of affinity for the cause. So doing it, you know, doing a little bit of what we call database mining, where we just go through our records, you know, and just kind of track everybody's involvement and, and how diverse people have, have uh been involved with the organization over the years. So, so we don't just want to limit this to people who, let's say, have made monetary donations in the past, but certainly start with those that have that have made monetary donations because this is something that really gets overlooked by a lot of groups. Um, it's very difficult for somebody to go out and hit up a whole bunch of people and ask them to you know, make a monetary contribution to a cause when they themselves have not made a monetary contribution to that cause. So making sure that the people you're sending out have actually made their own donation, whether it's been made recently or whether it was made last year, as long as they have made at least one donation to the cause, you know, during the course of their involvement with the organization, that really is a huge prerequisite. And it just goes back to the old question that a lot of us might get asked, and that is, well, how much have you given? And when the answer is zero, well, usually the response from the person we're approaching is also going to be matched by that. So having people who have already made some kind of, even just a token contribution to the cause, this is often a very huge prerequisite. So it really helps when the people going out have made their own contribution. And of course, we're hoping that a lot of these people happen to be either current or past board members, because in, in most cases, of course, most, uh, you know, very few people associated with the cause show a greater affinity than those who are actually governing the cause. So having board members and past board members involved you know, really um, sends a huge message to other, you know, prospective participants in that they're seeing the leaders of the organization and the past leaders of the organization involved. And so this is a way of also generating gravity and just encouraging other participants to get involved. But certainly volunteers and staff, um, suppliers, so the person who does our books, our lawyer, the person that comes and checks out our propane tank every year, um, our office suppliers, our you know, transportation providers, um, any group or any business that, you know, helps us with our operating needs in any form, don't be afraid to get them involved, especially if they've been involved, if they've supported other aspects of the organization, such as sponsoring a whole golf tournament or purchasing tables at galas, that kind of thing. Representatives from other organizations. This is another area that sometimes gets overlooked and sometimes it's for taboo purposes, but there is quite, you'd be surprised at the quid pro quo aspect in the nonprofit sector, because oftentimes we do support one another, especially if these are organizations that we partner with on different projects and in different areas, you know, groups that we share resources with. So resources can include also, again, people and money. And so we might uh, we might put a team together for one of their events and they might put a team together for one of our special events. And so it's a way of just kind of, you know, scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. But this is there's also some great opportunities for cross-pollination in terms of the donors. That is, some of their donors, you know, because they give to that cause, 
well, maybe they might realize that, you know, supporting both organizations might actually enhance their overall impact. The, the, uh, that is the impact of their contributions, the donors' contributions to the well-being of the community at large by supporting both causes. Now, of course, we also don't want to overlook clients, and, you know, and, and their families. And once again, I understand this can be a very sensitive issue in many cases, um, but you never want to naturally exclude your, your, your clients. It's actually a very healthy practice to give them a chance to at least say no. We don't want to necessarily jump to the conclusion because this is also a way to, to really offend a lot of people. When, when we presume that you know, our clients don't want to get involved because we feel it's going to be a burden for, to them. But it's, you know, employing that sort of a mentality really is a, a regressive practice because what that really does is, is it devalues fundraising in the overall pursuit of the mission and vision. And when we devalue the importance of fundraising, we're, we're basically, you know, shooting ourselves in the foot and more or less uh, making things difficult for ourselves because, you know, when we've got a negative fundraising environment, it makes things just a little bit more difficult to get out there and actually raise money because we're, we're almost gaslighting ourselves. We're kind of sowing doubt in our minds that maybe maybe we're not so worthy. So these, are, these can be some very unhealthy practices when we don't give our clients and their families the chance to either opt in or opt out of fundraising activities. Now, once we've got the people target, that is once we've got our prospects identified in terms of who we want to perhaps take place or sorry, take part in a peer to peer appeal, that is once we've chosen the people who are going to approach people within their respective spheres of influence, the next thing we want to do is we want to choose a platform where each individual participant can use to construct their own campaign page. That is, so each participant can basically create their own fundraising page and direct people to go towards and actually support their efforts. So, you know, the classic, of course, I think when we when most of us think about these kinds of pages, we think about GoFundMe. But as we'll see just before we, uh, we wrap up this presentation today, um, there's uh, there there really are a plethora of different types of fun of a peer to peer appeals, particularly the kind of platforms that um, that are also um, that they also work in tandem with our CRMs and databases. So we want to choose a platform where basically any information being entered onto their platform page basically automatically gets entered into our system. You know, and this just allows us to manage, you know, proceeds and and issue receipts and just tabulate things a little bit more, you know, a, a little bit more smoothly than let's say if they were to do their own, you know, their own separate, um, you know, campaign page. So, so choosing a platform that's user friendly, that's fairly straightforward in terms of, you know, if if you've got participants that might want to you know, create their own page, we want to make sure that we're doing so in a very, very straightforward and very user-friendly manner. Now, if you're, when, when your participants are constructing their own pages, a couple of things that we certainly want to keep in mind is we want to make sure that people know, not only know where their money is going, but what kind of a difference is their money going to make? So, we don't just want to articulate the cause by outlining the mission and the vision of, of the, um, you know, of the organization. But more specifically, what is the what specific facet of the programs and services that that organization offers? What specific facet is is going to benefit from their donation? And even more importantly than that, once this donation has been made, what kind of a difference is it going to make in the lives of the people that we're serving? In other words, how is this going to make the community more vibrant, more vital? Um, how is this going to make this a better place to live and to work and to play for everybody? So we want to make sure that the donor knows exactly how their investment, not only how it's going to achieve, but what kind of an impact is it going to have on the community at large? Now, Oftentimes, donors and, and certainly participants want to know, you know, how are things looking? Like, you know, have they set targets? And that's another thing. We, you know, it really helps when, you know, when we help our 
when we encourage our participants to set goals for themselves, that is, how much money do they think they're capable of raising from within their within their social circles? And certainly, we want to be conservative. Maybe the first time we do this, but once you when you're doing this on an annual basis, this allows us to maybe surpass last year's goal. So that, you know, so progressively, it gives us something to work towards. So establishing a goal and having some kind of a mechanism on their page, which charts the progress and monitors, you know, how close we are to reaching that goal. So things like your standard, you know, donation thermometer, like we see on your, your typical United Way page or any, uh, any capital campaign will have, you know, their thermometer where our, you know, where, um, you know, the top of the, the, uh, the top of the stick is is the goal and that's where the bell goes off and all these great things happen so where are we in relation to that so some sort of a mechanism that just again not only that this this might encourage some people to you know maybe you know step forward with a challenge uh, contribution if they feel that you know that's going to get them over the hump now of course as we said earlier we want to make these things you know as easy and as straightforward for the donor to make their pledge and we also want to make sure that you know we're we, we we're choosing a platform that's going to enable the donor to receive not only their recognition but their tax receipts and anything else they need to actually move forward so i was hinting earlier that you know the, the huge part that is overlooked the the value added of a peer-to-peer -peer fundraising appeal is how potentially this can also feed our base of support so when you're collecting information on some of these platforms, we don't just want to collect the, the, the obvious information, such as their name, address, you know, province and postal code and telephone number, etc. But also, you know, let's have the, you know, ask if, it, if it's okay to, um, you know, obtain their social media contact, because we might want to just keep them in the loop going forward as to the residual impact that their donations are having. In other words, we want we 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 want some kind of a, a mechanism in our possession that will enable us to actually store these relationships. In other words, give them an opportunity to develop an affinity for the cause. And so, if they if they're willing to provide us with their with their social media info, whether it's Instagram or Facebook or Twitter or Reddit or, or what have you. You know, this, <clears throat> excuse me, this is a means for them to continue to see the work that we're doing so that, again, we're giving them an opportunity to develop an organic attachment of the work of the organization and of the mission and of the vision. And most importantly, we want to get them to start to begin to care about the lives that are being impacted by the work that we're doing. So, and of course, we, we absolutely, um, this is, this just goes towards um, due diligence and just common courtesy but make sure you find out precisely how they want to be recognized you know do they want their full name do they want their short you know do they want dave do they want david do they want jessica do they want jesse so how do they want to be recognized do they want their corporate name or their company name up there uh, do they want their club name do they want to remain anonymous so absolutely find out exactly how do they want to be formally recognized on uh, any correspondence or any information that might get circulated. Now, the one thing that um, I kind of hinted at earlier, you know, one of the drawbacks, of course, is when participants feel like they've got this Robinson Crusoe syndrome, where they're on this desert island and they don't really have any form of support and morale can really you know, can really deteriorate in a hurry so at all times we want to make sure from the beginning until you know um, pro, you know proceeds are submitted and even afterwards we want to make sure that particip participants know that we have their back so support and encouragement you know to the participants at every stage if you haven't heard from them in a while check in with them periodically but also systematically so make sure that you know let's say we don't want a week to go by where we don't hear back from our participants during an appeal you know or we don't or better yet four days would actually be a better practice so every four days make sure that we're checking in with them how are things going do you need any information from us is there anything we can do and oftentimes in, ter in terms of identifying people within their respective spheres of influence, sometimes we might actually need to get involved with them and just not just give them a nudge, but to maybe inspire them to maybe 
look, you know, to consider other areas or other avenues that they have maybe considered exploring. So this is almost like sitting down and doing like a webbing exercise. But if you find that one of your donors or supporters that, were, that are raising money on your behalf, if they're encountering a little bit of difficulty in identifying prospects that they want to approach, um, sit down with them and maybe just review their six degrees of separation. So obviously we want to make sure that they've considered all immediate family and friends. You know, there's going to be people that they absolutely want to hit up. And then there's people that they would never want to hit up. So who they feel comfortable approaching, who they, who they want to exclude. Let's make sure we've covered that thoroughly. Then, of course, we want to think about people that they rub shoulders with at work, even in the virtual world. So colleagues and coworkers. Um, Neighbors, even if they live in a rural community, our closest neighbor might be a mile down the road, but still, we don't want to overlook these contacts, people that we interact with on a fairly regular basis. You know, their business suppliers, especially if they happen to be entrepreneurs, if, um, you know, if they happen to hold a fairly influential position in a company, maybe they have some sort of a, um, you know, a connection with people like business to business providers that they happen to be associated with, secondary contacts. In other words, a family member, a friend that they've already approached, maybe they might want to hit up one of their neighbors. So there's always these secondary contacts that people they have already approached and those people have already given. So there might be a little bit of residual impact coming from those areas. And don't be, you know, and don't be afraid to maybe ask them to consider other hats that they've worn. That is, do they do they go to church? Are they a part of a service club of some kind? Are they a part of a sports league? You know, what different activities are they involved with besides work and family? So other hats that they may, you know, that they may wear. So would they might would they ever consider approaching other people in their parishes or other people in their congregations, other people in their clubs, other people's on their on their sports teams and whatever associations, other people in the union. Um, so what other different hats, what other capacities they serve, you know, make sure we're not overlooking opportunities in those areas as well. Now once um of course Having, like I said earlier as well, making sure that that um, things are collected within a certain time frame. Again, just to keep everything nice and structured, you know. And this way, you know, things balance, and we, you know, um, you know, our statements aren't thrown off, and mo most importantly, everybody gets recognized. In other words, we want to, you know, especially when you're doing appeals. One of the most important things with with appeals is to achieve closure. And you can only really achieve closure of a campaign if all the proceeds are actually collected and tabulated and receipts issued and such. There's a, just as an aside, like when you're doing things like direct mail and individual campaigns, there's really two rules that we want to follow. The first thing is we want to get it out. That is, we want to get the ask out there. And once we get the ask out there, rule number two is get it in. And we want to make sure that when we're getting it in, that getting it in falls within a very specific and very structured time frame, so we're not just leaving things out there willy nilly. Um, obviously, this should go without saying, but thank you, letters and tax receipts being issued promptly. You know, time sensitive. We don't want a month or two months to go by. Heck, we don't even want a week to go by between you know money being received and thank you letters being issued, and of course tax receipts along with that. Recognition must be appropriate and tasteful. We don't necessarily want to give like a tacky ticker tape parade for every $10 supporter that comes our way. But you know, something nice and tasteful, something that would make them feel good about being a part of the solution, certainly is, uh, you know, you know, something that we want to make sure is, you know, it's not loud, it's not understated, but it's kind of just right as they say, you know, kind of like Goldilocks and the Three Bears in that regard. But I think most importantly, and once again, this goes back to the importance of things like collecting social media information, you know, getting as many different ways to reach out until they choose to opt out of the of, of the relationship. But give the new donors a chance to say no, you know, but do so in the process of letting them see the value of what it is you're doing. This is a topic for another day, but one of the things that we often say in fundraising is when for every ask, that is for every type of communication that revolves around a request or an ask, we want to balance that with four or five additional 
um, forms of communication, which have nothing to do with asking, but rather it's about showing them their donor dollars and their, their time and energy at work. In other words, showing them the impact that their investment of money or t- or time and energy or in-kind support or a combination of these things, showing them how their collective investment is having an impact on the quality of life of the people and the organizations and the communities that we're serving. So most importantly, cultivate new relationships because we've got people coming in, we've got, we're feeding our donor base. So the idea is we want to make sure that these bases of support become sustainable. And by sustainability, we're talking about building relationships. And by building relationships, we mean long-term relationships. And the secret to building long-term relationships is communicating with our supporters and establishing two-way communication. So it's not just about us talking to them, it's also encouraging them to talk to us. We want to learn what makes them tick. We want to learn more about their philanthropic interests and needs. You know, what do they want to see done? What areas do they want to support? How can we work with them to help them to be their brothers and their sisters keepers? Now, just a a couple of things I want to mention here as far as the different types of you know, campaigns that we can employ with with peer-to-peer sort of techniques and approaches. And like I say, like there they really is a, like a wide range here. So we mentioned bikeathons and 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 walkathons, but also birthday and anniversary appeals, you know, along with retirements too. And what we mean by this is in lieu of gifts. So instead of buying me a tacky birthday present or instead of buying us something on our anniversary, make a don we we want to invite you to make a donation to our favorite cause. So we're setting up a birthday donation page here. And you often see this with Facebook a lot, where you know people are raising money for the Canadian Cancer Society or for the Parkinson Society or somebody. And you know, or Habitat for Humanity. And so um, so we, it would mean a lot to me if you would donate anywhere from this amount to this amount, you know, if you, would, if you wouldn't mind following this link and going to this page. And, find, and not only that, they would find out a little bit more about the causes that you are supporting. And that, like I say, the same thing can, can, can be applied to retirements, Christmas and holiday appeals, of course. Now, this, there, this is kind of like a two, we're talking about two different concepts here, actually, when we're talking about Christmas and holiday appeals. In other words, instead of buying me a Christmas present, you can go to my favorite, you know, you can go to this, excuse me, this donation page that we've made up and make your contribution there. And so once again, this can be an in lieu of gift. But also, of course, organizations that um, are doing, that are doing uh, Christmas appeals, maybe giving our more you know, get, encouraging some of our more loyal donors and some of our more loyal, um, you know, volunteers and such, would they mind doing their own individual Christmas appeals or separate appeals where they can approach people within their spheres of influence? And basically they're, they're, they're serving almost like ambassadors of the organization and extending requests, you know, to give towards our Christmas appeal to people within their respective spheres of influence, but it's coming directly from them on behalf of the organization. In memoriam, so when we're in, so th- this would apply not just to somebody who perhaps has passed, but, you know, on the anniversary of their passings, you know, just, you know, if there happens to be a cause that was near and dear to their hearts uh, or something that, you know, the family might want to make a contribution towards, certainly that's something that would work. Game nights. This is more of a special event, especially um, a, uh, you know, like a, a virtual special event where some organizations are encouraging groups to get involved in, and this is almost like a combination social and uh, fundraising. And in some cases, even this may even be part of the programming, depending on the nature of the organization. But when you're, when you're hosting a game night, you can actually approach people and ask them to sponsor your game night. So a bunch of us are going to be playing risk over the weekend. Um, and so just to support our efforts, we invite you to go to our page here and you can su- kind of support our efforts. You know, it's a risk marathon or a risk binge or something. We're playing Monopoly. We're playing chess. We're playing backgammon. And so, you know, just on a regular basis. And this, by the way, this is something you can actually do uh, on a cyclical or on a regular basis. So once every quarter hosting a game night where we invite people to maybe support um, our efforts the same way we would ask them to support us if we were taking part in a bike a um, Virtual stay-at-home galas, very much the same thing, asking people to sponsor us. Capital campaigns, acquisition appeals. 
And this is this is a lot more direct by an acquisition appeal. Basically, we're we're directly asking our most um, ardent supporters, you know, those who have you know demonstrated a strong level of commitment and affinity for the cause, we're asking them to basically go out and recruit new donors on our behalf. And so this is kind of like where they're making a personal appeal on behalf, you know, on behalf of the organization to their friends and family members and other contacts within their six degrees of separation, just to, would they consider supporting this cause that means so much to me? Um, we would welcome your support and we look forward to, you know, showing you the impact of the, what that investment is, is going to have, not only immediately, but going forward down the road. Now, gift matching appeals, this is where, when, uh, when a donor has made a contribution, they might, you know, especially if we're talking about a fairly significant contribution. So if I'm somebody that makes a $500 commitment, I'm going to hit up my friends and neighbors and ask them to help me match that amount. So, so collectively, I'm raising another $500 from friends and family in little dribs and drabs. Um, challenges like the ice bucket challenge, skydiving, roller coasters, getting us to conquer our fears. <laughs> this is something that, you know, uh, we might want to ask people to support our efforts. So we're going to be, you know, we're going to be riding, you know, Leviathan or Behemoth. We're going to be jumping out of a plane. Um, we're going to be taking part in next year's polar bear competition, you know, on New Year's. So we're going to be jumping in a, you know, a frozen lake or something along those lines. But, you know, facing our challenges is, is another thing that, again, there, well, there's a little fun element to this and just it makes things a little bit interesting and, you know, can sometimes be that little extra nudge that would get people to, to actually get involved monetarily. Now, a few things I want to mention here about the different types of, of platforms. Now, um, I'm not going to go through each of these because they all have their own little, you know, um, they all have their pluses and negatives. But what I've got here are just kind of eight of the more common and some of the more um, more popular and certainly user-friendly platforms that you'll find. Donor Perfect and Black Butter is something that I'm fairly familiar with. Salsa is what I'm just getting to know right now. So these three especially are extremely relevant these days. Kindful, I've seen, I don't really know a lot about them, but they've got some tremendous reviews. And the same with a lot of these other ones. Bloomerang is about the only one I'm really, really familiar with on this page. But just, uh, you know, based on reviews and just on feedback I've received from other people, Give Life Charity Proud and Fundraise are also platforms that you might want to consider because the one nice thing about each of these platforms is they can be segued into your existing CRM. Um, anyway, uh, folks, I just want to um, thank everybody for taking part here today. And, and I'm just going to stop the share here for the moment and come back to our little um, shot here. And uh, not sure if anybody has any questions at all. Do you have a uh, list of that that you can send out of all? Uh, yeah, actually, um, th this um, this is going to be accessible on on the Net Squared uh, website. Oh, okay. I think uh, within should be within the hour, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but uh, yeah, th and this is also recorded, like I say, and um, so. Is Net Squared yep. Tech Soup? I believe Event Squared, yes. Um, TechSoup.org. Um, what I can do, I can email you guys the link afterwards. How does that sound? Oh, that'd be awesome. Yep. So I, so I can make sure that you guys get the uh, the direct link for, you know, for all this stuff. Um. And of course, if anybody has any questions, um, by all means, uh, don't hesitate to call or contact us. And um, there's the, the way this is going to work is I, I, I'm supposed to be doing one of these each quarter. So uh, we're probably going to be doing another one of these in September. So I'd be happy to keep you guys in the loop in that regard as well. And don't know what the topic is going to be, um, although we might. I might be repeating the one I did last time, just, just to you know, just because I guess there's a lot of people that wanted to, uh, to hear about that one, and they, they'd like to take part in an actual live presentation. So it might be on the the effectiveness of a CRM, a, a consumer relations management system, uh, aka database. So, but I'm not 100% sure exactly what the topic will be. I'll probably know within the month. 
But I will definitely love to keep you guys in the loop if that's okay. Um, anyhow, if there's no other questions or anything, um, I just want to thank you guys once again for taking part. And uh, by all means, stay safe and, um, you know, best of luck in the summertime. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again. Thanks so much, Mike. Great. That's been great. Do you ever teach um, a course on like monthly, how to establish monthly giving programs? Um, yeah, and maybe that could be something I do next, you know, next uh, quarter. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so thanks for the idea. <laughs> um, yeah, by all means, and actually, you know, we could probably even work some of this info in there as well. Yeah, setting up a, like a monthly donor program, um, especially with, like one from scratch, like. The, the traditional way of doing a monthly donor program is, you know, kind of like part of your, your traditional moves management process where, you know, people that have been giving at various levels, like for an extended time frame, we invite them to maybe become a monthly supporter. But what's wrong with asking a person to become a monthly supporter from the get go? Right. You know, at a very modest amount. I mean, what's nice about monthly giving, of course, is just the income certainty, you know, which certainly, uh, you know, aids us when we're doing things like grants and, you know, and other fundraising campaigns. Mm -hmm. So, Alrighty. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Great. Well, thank you guys. And, and I appreciate you, everybody taking part and um, hope you have a great summer. Okay. Take care. Alrighty. Take care guys. Bye.